there was one system that stood above the rest in the eyes of the press. That system was hailed as the fourth revolution in personal computing by Business Week magazine, truly a computer to change the world forever. That computer was this, the Epson HX20. It may not seem like much now, but as one of, if not the first, real portable computers, you can see why people were excited for a real computer with built-in printer and tape drive weighing at just 3.5 pounds. To show you just how far ahead the HX20 was with portable technology, even this VTech WizKid pre-computer from three years later dwarfs it. And this thing isn't really even a computer. So was the Epson HX20 the revolution in computing the media promised? How does it hold up today? Hi, I'm Jacob from Tech Retrospective, and today we're going to take a deep dive into the Epson HX20. In 1942, Hisao Yamazaki, local clock shop owner and former employee of Kei Hattori, in Nagano, Japan, started a company called Daiwa Kogyo Limited, which was partially funded with the support of the Hattori family, who incidentally were also the founders of the Seiko Group. In 1943, Seiko Instruments was known as Daini Seikosha, and they opened a factory nearby to manufacture Seiko watches with Daiwa Kogyo Limited, providing many of the parts. In 1959, Suwa Seikosha Co. Limited was formed when Daiwa Kogyo Limited and Daini Seikosha merged. Two years after merging, a company called Sinshu Seiki Co. was established to once again manufacture the tiny parts for Seiko watches. Shinshu Seiki began to shift into building printers when Seiko Group was designated the official timekeeper of the 1964 Olympics. As part of that project, they designed and built timing printers which easily provided records of event results. In 1968, Shinshu Seiki released the EP-101, the world's first mini electronic printer. In 1975, the name Epson was coined for the new printers planned at the time. And by 1981, when the HX20 came along, Seiko Epson was the official company name. The Epson HX20 was originally designed in 1980 at a branch of Seiko in Japan. It was known as the HC20 in Japan and the HX20 in North America. The HX20 was first shown in North America at the Comdex show in 1981, where its small size made it one of the hot items on display that year. In 1982, it received a huge mass-marketed rollout. So what's inside the case? Inside the case is a fantastic example of how the strengths, weaknesses, and background of a company determines the outcome when the time comes to enter the boundless new computer market. Seiko Epson made its fortune manufacturing tiny parts with precise measurements. That knowledge and experience clearly shows in the design of the HX20, but even the design of the electronics is done well. It has two Hitachi 6301 processors running at 614 kilohertz. The 6301 was based on the Motorola 6801 CPU, but had more registers with instruction sets to manage them. You might think a dual processor system would be a powerhouse, but remember the 614 kilohertz clock speed. Also, the processors didn't share tasks. They each handled their own specified functions. One big advantage to the slower clock speed is less power consumption. The rechargeable NICAD battery would last up to 50 hours, at least according to the manufacturer's specs. The HX20 came standard with 16 kilobytes of RAM, which could be expanded by the use of a compartment at the bottom of the unit. The edge connector is an expansion port designed to work with an expansion unit that contains sockets for RAM and allowed the ROM to be upgraded to 72K. 
the expansion unit communicated directly with the memory bus and could be mapped using the ever popular dip switches. Dip switches? Life got so much better when EEPROMs came around. The real story is how much stuff is on the outside of this tiny machine. The full transit 68 key keyboard is a major step up from even some of the desktops of its time. Seiko Epson made use of their knowledge of LCD technology from their calculators to provide a 120 by 32 pixel LCD display with four lines of 20 characters. The display was controlled by six ICs with multiple modes and an ability to export one of four colors to an external display. If you're thinking four rows of 20 column text is less than practical, so did the American computer market. The display was a big complaint with critics and played a major part in its short lifespan. It's worth noting when it was released, it was still relatively ahead of its time, but LCD screens very quickly advanced past it. A microcassette drive was originally a $160 option and came in the form of a small enclosure that slid easily into place. Later systems had this drive included. While dot matrix printers had been around for years before the release of the HX20, Epson's design experience and ability to create and manufacture small components stood out once again. The tiny printer, which was also used on some office calculators, could print 42 lines per minute and proved to be a very reliable unit. Despite its small size, the HX20 was designed to be a system you could use on the go and still act as a base for a larger, more versatile modular setup. For this reason, it had 5-pin and 8-pin RS-232 connectors. Seiko Epson produced accessories such as an acoustic coupler, floppy drive, voice synthesizer, and external display, all of which plugged directly into the HX20's RS-232 ports. The HX20 offered business users options never before available to them. An external barcode reader port came standard, and computer users were liberated by the prospect of having an entire computer system they could take with them as they made their way through the warehouse. Software was not one of the HX20's strengths. There was not an operating system capable of running from the microcassette drive. What you did get was Epson Basic and a simplistic word processing program. There was also a monitor program which would allow you to access memory and debug, but often programmers and power users were able to take advantage of the HX20 much more than your average casual user. I have to say, this computer holds up really well despite being a 40-year-old design. Seeing someone writing their world-defining screenplay on one in a coffee shop wouldn't be that out of place. In fact, we picked up our system for $100 complete with the case, power supply, and the handy Skywriter shortcut key template. Taking a look at the outside of the Epson HX20, it's very clear that the exterior was designed to last. The top of the system contains the printer, the printer on off button, the paper feed button, the LCD display, the micro cassette drive, function keys, and the keyboard. Our system had a template for its function keys that displayed shortcut commands for the included Skywriter word processing software. The right side of the system houses the power switch, the viewing angle adjustment knob, mic, headphone, and a remote connector, the external barcode reader port, the reset button, and the ejector for the microcassette drive. On the back, you'll find the cartridge release for the tape drive, the DC power input, an RS-232 port, and a serial port. The left side contains a port for expansions like an external floppy drive. The HX20 overall received mixed to positive reviews. It was praised for its build quality and advanced portable design. The one thing that really stopped this system from being a bigger success was the changing way users interacted with computers. Writing your own basic programs was quickly being replaced by buying published software, something that this system really wasn't built for and Epson completely overlooked. 
Operationally, many of these units are still working today, with the exception of the NICAD batteries, which almost always fail over time. By 1986, Epson had shifted its focus to PC compatibles, specifically the Equity line, which lasted until 1989. The late 80s saw the computer industry rapidly thinning out, and Epson withdrew completely from the market. And now for the ratings. Rarity gets a 3 out of 5. With 250,000 units sold, this system should be fairly common, but many of those units were sold to government institutions and have remained in their storage archives to this day, making it a semi-uncommon system. Price gets a 3 out of 5. For an all-in-one system, these aren't that pricey and you can find some really killer bundles. Aesthetics get a 3 out of 5. I'm not really sure what about it. I think it's the compact design and the printer and the micro cassette drive being included, but it really gives it a retro coolness you don't see very often. Software gets a 1 out of 5. This is as bottom of the barrel as you can get for official software, but there have been some very interesting homebrew demos created for this system in recent years. Ease of repair gets a 4 out of 5. Most parts of this system are modular and can be swapped out. It's extremely rugged, and the NICAD battery is pretty easy to replace. All right, well, that was our first look at the Epson HX20. Really cool computer. I really like this thing. Mega hipster points if you... Mega hipster points if you bring it to your coffee shop. Um, I think it's a quite influential computer. But that'll be it until next time. We'll power this bad boy on and test it some other time. Until then, please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that youtube -y stuff, and make sure to join our Discord server. Uh, if you know of any other cool, weird, obscure handheld-esque computers uh, that you'd like to see us demo. And I'll see you guys next time.